Hey folks, um, thank you for joining sure, sure. us today. I'm Ben Rubin, uh, CEO and co-founder of 10% Happier. Matthew Hepburn, uh, one of our teachers. Hi folks. Uh, I think their intent with this session was to get us to all sort of chill. Oh, oh, can we hear me now? Yes. Great. Uh, I think the intent for the session was to get us all to chill out. Uh, but what we may learn very quickly is that actually that may be a misconception about what meditation really does. So I'm going to start off with a sort of a quick introduction to sort of how I found meditation, and I hope that um, might inspire some of you that may think um, it might not be interesting to give it a listen. And then we're going to have a quick conversation uh, about some of the principles around meditation and mindfulness. And then Matthew is actually going to lead us in a five-minute practice. So this is me in 2007. Um, I had started a tech company called Zio, and I was what I'd call sort of your classic sort of annoying, young, smart CTO. Um, the first thing you might have noticed if you walked into a room with me was that I was kind of an asshole. Um, I had this problem where I was always literally the smartest person in the room. No one else in the room could compete with my massive intelligence, and they just couldn't realize it. Um, and so you can imagine how that worked out for me um, in this tech company. And ultimately, I think it's one of the major reasons that it failed, because I couldn't communicate with my coworkers. I couldn't communicate with the CEO we hired, who I was trying to undermine really at every step of the way. And at the end of this, you know, Zio was a $32 million smoking hole in the ground. And I realized I had to do something about the way I interacted with people. Otherwise, I just wouldn't be successful professionally. So people kept telling me about this place, uh, the Insight Meditation Society. And I took a look at the website. And for three years, I ran the other direction. Because there were flowers, and there's a statue of the Buddha. And it says tranquility, wisdom, and compassion. And so I was pretty sure I was going to be running into a cult that I might never be able to emerge from if I went to the Inside Meditation Society. Uh, but over you know, a couple of years of different people telling me it might be useful, meditation might help you with some of the challenges you're facing, I eventually did make my way to a five-day retreat at the Inside Meditation Society and learned that meditation sort of at its core wasn't about what I thought it was. It was really about a simple principle, uh, maybe not so simple, called mindfulness. Whoop. And mindfulness, just to give sort of one simple serviceable definition, is the ability to know what's going on in your head right now without getting carried away by it. And that sort of one principle by sort of paying attention to one thing at a time and noticing sort of what comes up enabled me to really change the way I work with people. So this is a picture of Matthew and uh, my coworker Souza, two absolutely incredible professionals that five, seven years ago, if they'd met me, would have literally run the other direction. Because the only way I knew how to interact with people professionally was basically to argue with them. Right? It was, you either agree with me or we fight about it until you change my mind. And that style of interacting um, was pretty much useless with you know, 50 or 60 or more percent of some of the most incredible people in the world. And so meditation sort of enabled me to notice when I was getting argumentative, notice when I was getting angry, and actually communicate instead. Um, so I met, um, to start 10% Happier, this guy a few years after I started practicing. Dan, um, sort of on a large scale, has a story similar to mine. He's an ABC News anchor who had a panic attack on air 10 years ago. Uh, in front of five million people, and then wrote a personal memoir about how he found meditation incredibly useful, something that he always thought was basically for hippies and folks who were nothing like him. So when I read Dan's book that's in... Uh, that's me. Years, oh. <laughs> hippies and people who are nothing like Dan. That's right. And when I read that book, I realized if I had read it many years earlier, I wouldn't have taken three years to eventually drag myself to meditation, I would have taken up the practice and gotten to some of those benefits a lot more quickly. So let me uh, let us hear from Dan just for a few seconds before Matthew and I have a quick conversation about the practice. Hey, I'm Dan. I'll be honest. When I first heard about meditation, I was pretty hesitant because I'm a skeptical TV news anchor with the attention span of a three-month-old golden retriever. But then 
I had a panic attack live on the air, which sucked. But long story short, it ultimately led me to meditation. On this app, I'm bringing together my favorite teachers and scientists, people who are maximally clear, qualified, and cool. You're going to meet several of them over the next 10 sessions where we will show you how to meditate, run through the science. So that's Dan, a uh, pretty incredible communicator uh, and my co-founder. And we pair him with incredible teachers like George Mumford, who taught Kobe Bryant how to meditate, Joanna Harper, who teaches uh, in situations like prisons or teaches folks who are recovering addicts how to meditate, uh, and with Matthew, uh, who's here with us today. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, you know, in the conversation that ensues and in the short practice, um, that you'll sort of open your mind to whether this sort of practice could be useful for you in whatever personal or professional challenges you might face. So Matthew, welcome. Hey, uh, How did you get into meditation? I started in college. Um, really, I was going through a hard time. And uh, I guess, you know, I had, I had had some success in my life uh, up to that point, I felt I had, and uh, yet I was a total mess on the inside. And uh, the, the question that came up for me was, uh, it was really like, you know, have, humanity's best and brightest over the full course of history uh, figured out how to do something about this, right? Um, is there some sort of model for sustainable well-being? Um, and that was a driving question that um, got me into it, and it seemed immediately practical and relevant and accessible, and so yep. then, you know, kept going. And you've now been practicing for nine years, sort of intensive retreats, really going deep, it sounds like. Yes, and, you know, like living a day-to-day, -day, regular daily yep. life. I have friends who've gone on to take on robes and shave their heads, and um, that's a beautiful thing if you want to do it, and yet that's not necessary. Yeah. And in mm -hmm. fact, you are also in a tech job, like I think many of the people in the room, right, at Maxwell Health uh, as an analyst. Yeah, yeah. I, I just got up from my desk a, a couple hours ago and walked over here, and after this, I'm going to get up and walk back to my desk. <laughs> so. so for um, some of the folks in the audience, what are some of the sort of easy to quantify benefits of meditation? It's hard to keep up, frankly, for me. Um, there's probably 100 plus concurrent research projects going on, you know, rigorous studies that are happening around mindfulness. Um, you see Mindfulness Magazine on your way through the checkout line in Whole Foods. So this is, this is something that we're understanding culturally is um, extremely beneficial and that studies are on like everything from, um, you know, vital statistics that are related to longevity, early childhood development, PTSD, certainly anxiety and depression. Um, and, and so it's hard for me to keep up and, and what uh, what I find as a teacher are the, are the things that people tell me are the immediate benefits that they see are that people feel empowered that they don't need to be as pushed around by their cyclical thinking and by their uh, low moods or difficult emotions uh, that they have been their whole life. When you walk through your whole life and your mood dictates how well you can be clear, focused, and um, in the moment and doing what you intend to be doing, and then you find a set of practices that allows you to actually navigate that with a lot more grace and clarity, people are like, whoa, this is useful. So. Yeah, I've, I've certainly found that in my own life, that um, when I wake up and you know, I'm pissed off or I'm sad or I'm stressed, I can take a moment to acknowledge that and then still go about doing what I need to do for that day. Exactly. And you're, and you're, you're not pushing it down, right? You're not like, oh, shit, I'm stressed. I got to and get it. You're like, oh, I'm clear about where I'm at and I have the capacity. At least 10% of the time, right? That's maybe. <laughs> In my case. <laughs> um, so, you know, we have a room full of, you know, based on the previous presentations, meeting some folks, some high achievers, type A personalities, and one thing that we at 10% Happier hear all the time from these types of folks is that they're worried that meditation will erode their edge, right? If, if I become sort of okay with whatever's happening, um, you know, does that mean I'm not gonna try and make things different or achieve in my life? So 
you know, both in your life and in sort of the teaching that you've done, you know, how have you sort of seen that evolve? Well, I think for one thing, I'm a lot more clear on what matters to me to achieve. Um, you know, I used to kind of be all over the place. And as I've gotten more clear, I've been able to sort through all the different voices in my head that are flying around, right? Um, it's allowed me to be a lot more crystal clear about what matters, where I should invest my time and energy. So you're focusing more. I'm focusing a lot more. And the other side of this is that um, I used to take everything so personally on the road to achieve my goals. So every minor setback I would you know, feel was a threat to my self-worth. And when that happens, right, you get a minor setback, and in a time where you could be aware, paying attention to what's happening, and actually gathering data, learning, uh, for what to do different next time. Yeah, I was busy, you know, like beating myself up and going through these cyclical thought patterns yeah. that might last for 36 hours and I can't focus on anything, right? So. When we were prepping for the session and thinking about the topic of hypergrowth, I think that really highlights what the practice of mindfulness can do, right? Because learning and hypergrowth is all about quick cycles, right? If you can learn quickly mm -hmm. from the stumbles that you run into versus taking a long time, that's a, a massive difference. What about forget quickly and just go real time? And the, the practice of mindfulness will do a little bit is about um, watching in real time what's happening in real time. Yeah. And you, you can start to learn it by you know, doing a seated meditation practice, but the skill develops into something that you can walk around with all the time. Yeah. To, to give you an example of sort of how mindfulness has been useful in my professional career, uh, a few months ago, uh, I had a situation where someone came to me with what I initially thought was an absolutely terrible idea. It's one of our growth marketers who wanted to try a very specific way of offering a free trial. And I felt uh, in, sort of in me arising like anger at how dumb he was and like righteousness at how the idea that I had was going to be better. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I noticed that. I used sort of the skill of mindfulness. And I backed up and I said, Maybe I don't have the right answer here, right? In fact, time and time again, I clearly don't in business. Um, you know, maybe Mike has, you know, an insight here. We should let this run and, and go see. And the result, at least in this case, was pretty incredible, right? I was proven completely wrong. This technique of you know offering a free trial at the at the place where it did, you know, dramatically increased the number of people who got to try out the product. And you know, to me, that was a direct benefit of mindfulness. Uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, so the next question that we get um, is often around time, right? People who might have heard about meditation uh, acknowledge that, you know, maybe it could be beneficial, but man, I'm busy. I've, I've got a job. I've got kids. I've got everything going on. Um, you know, to what extent um, can, can we make the time or how do we make the time to do something that seems, uh, you know, to a certain extent counterintuitive? I think, um, you know, a lot of people come they don't even come to meditation, they project uh, toward meditation, the idea of somebody sitting in a full lotus posture, you know, under a waterfall or something for 60 minutes or, you know, two days at a time. And it, it really doesn't have to be like that. I mean, we're talking about developing a skill to be aware of what's happening in the present moment. And how long does it take to do that? How long does it take to be aware of what everything that you're bringing to the table in this moment internally is? to see then what pulls you away from your capacity to notice that and to bring yourself back. I mean, it maybe takes 60 seconds, 120 seconds. So if you can find 60 seconds, 120 seconds throughout your day and pepper this um, skill set in, you know, when you're riding the train, when you're waiting for a meeting room, when someone won't get out of the meeting room, when you're falling asleep at night, um, you know, it's, you just have to reframe what you imagine is necessary and, and you'll notice the results immediately. Yeah. And I, I think we're, we're about to do a little meditation. Once you learn sort of what that core skill is of focusing and then sort of losing yourself and then coming back, you really can practice it anytime, anywhere, and it can be a benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, before we jump into an actual meditation, um, I think many people in the room, some, some may have tried it, some may experience mind wandering. Right, and the immediate thought that many people have is, I'm not very good at meditation. In fact, I'm a shitty meditator because my mind can't stay on task. Um, as we're about to try this, like, what advice do you have for people who may have that thought come up? Yeah, if you have a wandering mind, you probably are a shitty meditator and you should just throw in the towel. 
<laughs> it's like fundamentally not how it is. Uh, the, for those of you who laughed, you, you laugh because you know inherently that th that can't be true. Um, and yet my job as a meditation teacher is often to wear down this myth in people that because their mind wanders, they think that they're uh, having a bad meditation or they're a bad meditator. And um, really the function of having your mind get distracted and bringing it back is the crux of where all the benefits of this practice come from. So if your mind's not getting distracted, then you don't have much to do. Yeah. So if, if you don't have the problem of having your mind distracted, you're already there and very unlikely to have that experience. But let's give it a try. Uh, so Matthew, go ahead and uh, kick us off. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave up there uh, if anyone wants to sort of dive in afterwards. We set up a, a free code so people can uh, play with the app and Matthew's on there. So the first thing to do is really just to notice what is up right now. If you're sitting, just know that you're sitting for a second. Okay? You can feel the body sitting here. That kind of just immediate, purely simple awareness that is the simplest form of mindfulness. It can help to um, close your eyes so that you're not visually so distracted. If you want, you can just kind of close them halfway. Uh, this just kind of limits the visual field so the mind isn't really, really, really active. Um, it's gonna be active looking in instead of active looking out. So just sit and know that you're sitting. You can hear sounds in the room. Notice you can hear sounds in the room. Hearing and knowing that the process of hearing is happening is mindfulness. Now notice you're also breathing. Been breathing this whole time, all day long. You can feel it happening. See if you can break knowing that you're breathing down into its component parts. What are all the different elements that you can feel in your body that tell you that breathing is happening? Maybe there's a tingling at the nostrils. Maybe there's pressure in the abdomen, release during the outbreath. Take a magnifying glass to this process and see if you can break it up into its component parts moment by moment. It's a very simple somatic experience of breathing and knowing that it's happening. So it may be a very simple thing to do. We point our attention towards something that's happening presently. But see if you can sustain your attention there. Intend to let your attention rest on just these sensations. And what will happen is the mind will naturally get distracted will come up with some compelling thought. I want you to see if you can notice what thoughts come up to pull the mind away. So to start, just notice the feelings of the very beginning of an in-breath. Watch how this constellation of feelings in the nose, in the throat, the chest, and the belly changes into an out-breath. As you're doing this, keep one eye open for the moment when distraction happens. Often it happens pretty quick. Usually some words or an image in the mind. When you notice distraction happening, this is the crux of the practice. First, just relax. Second, notice where you went. What were you thinking about? Don't make up a whole story about it, but be clear and aware. This is how we gain self-knowledge. So when you notice distraction, relax. Be aware of where the mind went. And then simply begin totally fresh come back to noticing these component parts of just sitting, breathing, noticing sound.
you may have to bring your attention back 10 times in five seconds. That's actually uh, the practice. That is meditation. Each one of those 10 times of returning from distraction is like a repetition that we're building this muscle of mindfulness. So if you've noticed where the mind has gone, you've learned something about the state of the mind today in this set of conditions. This is one data point that's useful. When you're ready, you can take one last deep breath and relax, and then open your eyes. And you can take this skill with you through the rest of the conference. Take a moment or two and just feel a breath. Relax, get connected to what's going on. You have on. to do that to go. When you feel yeah, the you breath. Have to. <laughs> I like to take a deep breath. It feels good. <laughs> but really, um, it takes almost no effort to get connected to what's happening right now. And this is a, one moment of more clarity than we had when we were being pushed around by whatever thinking was happening to go on. Right? Um, so take advantage of that. Now you know it. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us. Appreciate it.